This video is made possible by the free to play action game Crossout. Check out the game through the link in the description below, and you can start with three extra weapons or a vehicle cabin just for registering. So in the video today, we're answering a viewer question because Kaz Taylor asks us, why do blacksmiths tap the anvil after a few strikes? And who designed the first anvil? Anvil shape has evolved greatly since the earliest anvil-like objects. These primitive anvils were typically made of stone, often just a slab of rock. The first metal anvils were made of bronze, then wrought iron, and finally steel, which is the material of choice today, though cast iron is also used in low-end anvils. This is naturally ideal in many applications, owing to cast iron being quite brittle for this particular use, as well as the fact that it absorbs more of the hammer blow's energy than steel does. Over the centuries, the common shape of the anvil has evolved from a simple slab to the shape that most of us associate with an anvil today, namely the London pattern, which became common in the 19th century. While the length and overall size of the various elements can vary from anvil to anvil, the key features of the standard design are typically a horn, a step, a face, a hardy hole, and a pritchel hole. The primary use of these various elements is as follows. The horn is the front end of the anvil, which is curved. This allows the smith to hammer different curves into the piece that they are working on with the precise curve depending on how and what part of the horn they hold the piece of steel on while they hammer it. Some anvils also come with multiple horns of differing shapes and sizes. The step is the flat area next to the horn just below the face. This is often used as the cutting area, using the edge of the step to cut a piece while hammering it. However, frequent use of the step for this purpose can also damage it, so the use of tools attached to the anvil for cutting is often preferred for non-hobbyists. The face is the main large flat slab where most of the hammering takes place. It also contains the hardy hole and the pritchel hole. Unlike the step, it often features slightly rounded edges so that the edges don't cut into the metal being pounded on the face. The hardy hole is a square hole through the anvil that allows you to secure various tools in the anvil. These tools can include chisels, various swages used for shaping or marking the metal, generally a block of metal with a recess for forging the metal into the shape of the recess, bickens, smaller specialized versions of the horn. The hardy hole can be used directly for an aid in bending or in hole punching. The pritchel hole is a round hole meant to aid in punching holes through the metal that you're working on, but obviously the hardy hole can also be used for this. The pritchel hole can also be used for holding tools, so basically the pritchel hole is a round version of the hardy hole. On a related note, if you've ever watched a smith work, you've probably noticed many of them will strike whatever they're working on a few times, then follow it up by lightly tapping the anvil step or face a couple of times. You may have heard that they do this to cool the hammer down by having it come into contact with the anvil, but this is the opposite of what they'd want to do. Warm hammers and warm anvils are actually what they want because it keeps the hot metal they're working on from cooling down as quickly, so it requires less heating when shaping, which saves time. Further, the very brief contact between the hammer and the anvil isn't going to transfer very much heat, even if the anvil is quite cold. In reality, they are not actually tapping the anvil for any such purpose. Instead, they tend to use this to do things like partially rest their arm while they quickly examine the results of the last few strikes, or simply keep their rhythm while they examine the piece. In the former case, bouncing the hammer on the anvil next to the piece is simply a convenient way to rest. With it in this position, it is a shorter distance to bring the hammer back up to the appropriate striking position over, say, letting one's hammer and arm rest at one side while the piece is examined. Further, a good anvil will provide quite a bit of bounce when the hammer taps it, making bringing the hammer back up even easier. As for rhythm, some find it nice to just continue their hammering rhythm while they examine what they're working on rather than stopping completely. This can be important when turning a piece to help keep the exact rhythm to keep everything even. This rhythm can also help significantly when working with an assistant who is also working with the piece, keeping both parties in sync. Another reason to do this is to adjust grip on the hammer. Beyond potential slippage, it's common to adjust the grip on the hammer up and down the shaft for potentially more or less precise control and to control the force of the strike. As before, continuing to keep the rhythm of the striking tends to be why they tap the anvil rather than just stop and adjust their grip that way. 
As for why it's just a tap rather than striking the anvil, this not only saves energy, but also you should never pound an anvil directly with the hammer as it can cause slight deformations which would then be transferred to whatever you're working on in the future, unless you had the anvil resurfaced. And speaking of making cool things, today's sponsor is Crossout, and I want to tell you about them before we get into today's bonus facts. Crossout is a game where you get to make your own amazing vehicle and then send it into combat. Now, Crossout isn't one of those, well, yeah, you get to make your own vehicle, but by that we mean you can choose what ammo you put in the gun. No, in Crossout, you get to build a full-on main structure and then just build up from there. You do get to choose the ammo and the guns and, well, just everything. You want to stick a rail gun on there? Great. What about a rocket booster? How about some armor? It can all go on there and you're ready to fight. Build it well, you're going to dominate. Build it badly, well, you're going to get blown up. It's a super fast-paced game with loads of different game modes, and you've got pretty much limitless freedom to create. And what you do to your vehicle is entirely up to you. Also, a major plus is that it's not super complicated right from the start. You can just jump in and you'll be going in no time. No learning the ropes, just immediate gameplay. But then, as you get used to the game, you can come to master it. Join us on the battlefield for free using the link in the description below. PC, Xbox One, PS4, all supported. And going through that link gets you a free starter set with three extra weapons or a vehicle cabin. All is just a bonus for registering. And doing that is a great way that you can support this show. Our sponsors really make this whole thing possible. And let's get into those bonus facts. Anvil firing, the practice of launching an anvil in the air with gunpowder, was once traditional in various places in the world, particularly in the southern United States. Typically, one anvil is placed upside down with its concave base then filled with gunpowder. Powder. Another anvil is then placed on top of that anvil right side up, so their bases match with a fuse coming out of the inner concave area filled with gunpowder. Depending on the quality of gunpowder, the amount used, and the weight of the anvil, when the gunpowder ignites, the anvil will be shot into the air to various heights. This somewhat dangerous practice was often used in substitute for fireworks at certain celebratory events. It was also once traditionally used on St. Clement's Day. Pope Clement I is the patron saint of blacksmiths. And metal workers. And now for another bonus fact. The name blacksmith derives from the word smite, meaning to hit, and thus they work on black metal, with the metals typically turning black from a layer of oxides after being heated. Though, of course, this oxide layer is often ground and polished off to complete the piece. Anvils were once commonly made of wrought iron rather than steel. Wrought iron is just iron with a very low carbon content, lower than steel or cast iron. It was once considered pure iron, but by today's purification standards, Standards, this is no longer the case. Steel is simply iron that has a small amount of carbon added, usually 0.2 to 2.1%. Other materials such as manganese, chromium, tungsten, etc. can also be used. The net effect of adding carbon or the like to the iron is that it significantly hardens. When enough carbon is added, around 2.1 to 4% to the iron rather than steel, you get cast iron, which is derived from pig iron. Cast iron is much harder than steel, but the price for this is that it is much more brittle and less ductile. The name cast iron derives from the fact that it has a relatively low melting point and it is easy to cast. Pig iron is simply the result of taking iron ore and smelting it with some sort of carbon fuel such as charcoal or coke. The name comes from the fact that the branching structure of the molds for pig iron ingots coming off a main line has the appearance of piglets suckling on a sow. An ingot just means a shape suitable for later processing or transportation, such as a traditional gold bar type shape. Another fun fact is that iron is formed from decayed nickel-56. This nickel is produced in stars and is subsequently spread about via stars large enough to go supernova, doing so with it being the last element produced in those stars before they go boom. So, yes, anything you've got made out of iron was technically partially forged in the heart of a dying star. And now for another bonus fact. During World War I, as Unterseeboots, aka U-boats, were beginning to sink British ships, the British Navy hired blacksmiths to go and take them out. So, how and why did they do this? Well, when trying to figure out the best way to take these ships out, it was quickly noted that the one weakness of the U-boat was that it needed to use its periscope to mark its target before attacking. This all got the wheels turning among the military think tanks, with the result being that some rather humorous proposals as to how to solve the U-boat problem were developed, with particular emphasis puts on somehow taking out the periscope. After all, without the periscope, the U-boat's only way to target a foe would be to completely surface, making it a relatively easy target for more traditional and accurate weaponry. 
With proper escorts for the supply ships, this could solve the U-boat problem. But, well, how were they going to take out the periscope? In order to achieve this, it was suggested that they feed seagulls in certain regions they wanted protected through periscope-like devices. Moving on to slightly more practical solutions, one implemented in the early days of the war was to put sailors on small patrol boats, all equipped with the latest and greatest in anti-submarine technology, and that was large hammers and bags. They were thus instructed that if they saw a periscope popping up to the surface, they were to try and get close to it, then have one person place a bag over the periscope, while another got all whack-a-mole on it in an attempt to destroy it, hopefully all before the target could be identified and a torpedo launched. Exactly how effective this tactic is isn't clear, but we do know that it was popular enough for at least one senior officer aboard the HMS Exmouth to enlist the help of several burly blacksmiths with extra-large hammers to patrol with the sailors aboard the smaller boats. With their amazing hammering abilities, both in strength and blow accuracy, presumably it was hoped that they'd do a better job than your average sailor at quickly taking out a periscope. Of course, as more sophisticated technologies were developed, this tactic sadly became obsolete. But never forget that for for a brief but glorious time in history, there was a guy who could claim that his job was to hunt submarines with a giant hammer, no doubt giving a cry of bring me Thanos before smiting his foe. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, smash that like button below and do not forget to subscribe. Brand new videos every day of the week and do check out our fantastic sponsor Crossout. They are linked to below. And thank you for watching.